I've been kind of obsessed with collaborative editing for a long time, for over 10 years at this point. And in particular, I'm really interested in collaborative text editing, which is honestly the most interesting and the hardest form of collaborative editing that exists for weird reasons that I don't quite understand. I got into real-time collaborative editing and, and I'm interested in like the hardest problems in collaborative editing. So two users, maybe a hundred users, all editing the same time. Maybe we've got all of the United States Congress, you know, hundreds of people all making changes to a bill in real time. How could we build computer systems that could handle things like that? Handle real users doing real problems. I got interested in this about mm, like 2010, 2011, working on Google Wave. Wave was really ahead of its time. It got killed unceremoniously by Google while I was there, which was an interesting story in and of itself. But the idea was, well, what would it look like if we kind of took Gmail and took Google Docs and mashed them together into something that could potentially replace email? Or put it another way, what would email look like if it was invented today? And we built something, we designed something where you had real-time collaborative editing and also messaging and messages were also documents that anyone could edit. Um, it was a really cool piece of tech. Sadly, it's gone now. But one of the things I really liked about it, or that we tried to do with Wave, was build it as a federated system. Almost all software today is built as fully centralized systems, which is where there's one computer somewhere in the world, or one company with some computers, and all of your data is losing their computers. But unfortunately, we ran into problems. Google Wave at the time, remember this is the late well, it's like 2010, it was built on top of Operational Transform, which is this piece of collaborative real-time editing technology from the, the mid-90s. Um, we use the Jupyter OT system. And the Jupyter Operational Transform system, this is a certain way that you can do collaborative editing. It only really works if you've got two computers involved. And of course, there's a trick that everyone uses where you make one of those computers a server that, you know, in this case, Google runs. But we couldn't get it working. And one of the problems we had getting it working was that operational transform just doesn't work well like this. We built this hideously complicated system that I won't go into now to try and get it to work. What we really needed was we needed an operational transform like system that could also work in peer to peer settings. So it was 2009, 2010. There were actually early systems that could do this, that could solve our problem, but we didn't really know about it yet. It was really early on in the academic days of figuring these algorithms out. Um, and I am, of course, talking about CRDTs, or uh, conflict-free replicating data types. I'll try saying that 10 times fast. Operational transform works by taking all of my edits. Let's say I insert at position 1,000 in the document, and your edits, like you insert at position 2,000 in the document. And we can ask, if I knew about your changes when I made my changes, how would my change be different? If you knew about my change when you made your change, how would that be different? So if you inserted at position 2000, but you knew that I'd inserted another character at position 1000 in the document, well, click, everything should be clicked along one space. So your insert should be at position 2001 instead of just 2000. CRDTs do something quite different. They take this, uh, they create this idea of a, a CRDT object. And for a text document, this is a big list um, or a tree. And every item in that list corresponds to a character that was at some point at any point in history, inserted and maybe deleted in the document. So this list typically just only grows over time as the document is edited and have things are deleted and added. Now to update this data structure, you would think that we would just say, we'll insert something in position 1000. But the way that CRDTs work is we first of all have to transform every change into this special CRDT message format. So we take our, on my local computer, I'm editing using YJS, which is a CRDT library. I type a key at position 1000 in the document. So I type a J key. My local computer needs to have in memory the, that list, that CRDT object. And it finds position 1000 in the CRDT and it inserts a new special CRDT item there. Instead of saying that the insert position is 1000 now, we actually translate it to make sense in accordance with this list. So the CRDT object actually says, uh, insert this item between, you know, with some globally unique ID, between the item with globally unique ID A and globally unique ID B. Um, you know, and different CRDT algorithms work differently. So RGA, which is what AutoMerge at least used to use, uh, it says insert this item after the item with this particular ID, but in this particular order based on the sequence number with other concurrently inserted items, blah, blah, blah. Now, this solves our first problem. Well. 
I should probably tell you what the first problem, actually, there's kind of two problems with OT. I mentioned that operational transform-based systems really struggle in peer-to-peer -peer environments. There are more modern systems, OT systems that do that, but all OT systems that I know about suffer from this second problem, which is that when you have a lot of concurrent changes, like lots of users editing all at once in a, with an OT-based system, the whole thing gets really slow. So one of the editing traces that we end up recording for our paper based on a Git repository took over an hour to merge. And this is a document that's, you know, it's like a hundred kilobytes or something in size. An hour, it takes an hour to process this document using operational transform and merge all the changes together. In comparison, a good CRDT should be uh, able to process n changes in n log n time and uh, linear or n log n memory as well. So um, YJS and auto merge can process the same editing trace in much less than a second. Can't remember the numbers off the top of my head. So CRDTs solve that problem, but in exchange, we've got some new problems with CRDTs. First of all, we've got to have this big object in memory. And remember, we need this object in memory regardless of whether or not there are any collaborative changes. There's a secret, which you only really know about if you work on these systems for a long time, like I have. And that's that <laughs> most systems that support collaborative real-time document editing well, most documents never actually have any collaborative changes. Now, I wish I had real numbers for you. I've been told this anecdotally from a friend that worked, used to work at Evernote. I've, been, I've seen this firsthand when I worked at Lever and we worked on real-time collaborative database systems. Uh, but I suspect that it's true of Google Docs and other systems like this as well, where in reality, most documents are either edited only by one person. I mean, look through your own Google Docs library, you'll probably see that that's true. Or if they're edited by multiple people, then people take turns, in which case you don't need any of these systems. With CRDTs, you've got to pay the cost of this CRDT structure that's got to be loaded into your browser's memory every time the document's opened, um, just to be able to make changes, regardless of whether or not you've got any collaborative uh, users, whether or not you're making any changes with other people, because every change need to be, needs to be converted into the CRDT format um, so that other concurrent changes can be merged together. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk about Eggwalker, which is my new algorithm that solves this problem. Eggwalker approaches the whole thing slightly differently. So let's imagine we've got a text document that starts off saying, hi, and two users, me and you, we both concurrently edit the document. So I change the document from hi to hey, and you change the document from hi to hey, uh, sorry, to hi space Sam. So you type Sam at the end, I change it from hi to hey. As a result, the document should end up saying, hey, Sam, not hi, Sam, or not hey, um, once all of our changes have merged in. So Eggwalker does a couple things. It's kind of tricky to explain, but let me, I'm going to give it a red hot go. And if it doesn't make sense, please read the paper or take my word for it. It works pretty well. So the general approach is this. Based on the graph, so we've got this graph and we've got some uh, old changes that um, bring us to the current point in time that type the words hi. And then we've got my changes that say um, the change it from hi to hey, and your changes that say that type in uh, Sam, space Sam. What we want to do is, based on this graph, come up with a plan for how we can apply all of these changes to a local CRDT object to be able to merge all the changes in to get the final document state of hey Sam. And you can think of it kind of like this, these two stages. The first one is we come up with an action plan of all of the actions we need to perform. And then the second part is we're going to apply all of those actions to a CRDT. It's a slightly augmented CRDT. We're going to make one little change to it. And then the result of doing that is that we're going to be able to uh, essentially transform all the changes to find out how all of those edits can be applied one by one to end up with the right document state. So we can talk about the actions first, but I feel like all of the pieces here all only make sense with the context of all of the other pieces. So give me a little bit of a rope. We've got three different actions we're going to perform. We've got apply actions, which just modify the CLDT based on some set of operations that are in the graph. Then we've got retreat operations, which kind of undo the effect of some changes, some operations, some events on that graph. And we've got advance. And retreat and advance are opposites of each other. So if you retreat, then advance, then it has no effect. The CRDT state itself is augmented. So regular CRDTs are a list, and it contains an item with one, uh, sorry, it's a list with items where each item corresponds to, for a text document, one character that was ever inserted in the document. And each of those items has a state of whether it's in the inserted state or it's been deleted. 
So that way, obviously, things that are deleted don't take up space. With a regular CRDT, we can look up any position in that list by just counting. So if I'm looking for position five, I just count after five items that are in the inserted state. And if I didn't insert there, well, that's where my new item is going to get inserted in the list. But we need to be able to do something a bit more complicated. So um, I'm going to add a second state variable. So the regular state variable that says if items are in the inserted state or the deleted state, uh, after all of the things that we've ever seen, I'm going to call the end state. So this is the state after all of the items that we've visited so far. And items are always visited first using the apply action. So we're going to use the apply action. That will change the end state. And after that, the end state doesn't change until our next apply action. We're going to add another state variable, which is called the current state. And Eggwalker works by walking up and down the event graph, moving around to be able to apply changes at lots of different locations in the graph. So in our case, we want to go down and apply all of my changes, then retreat all of them, undo the effect of those operations, of those events, and then apply all of your changes. So it's going to be apply, retreat, and then apply again. When I do the retreat action, I'm actually only going to modify the current state. To make the current state look like the end state would have looked like before those changes were applied. So I'm changing it from high to hey. So I'm going to type an E and a Y, and I'm going to delete the I. So I've got these three events, and I need to undo the effect of them on the current state variable. Now, the current state variable, since we need to be able to undo an insert, also has an extra state that it can take up, which is the not yet inserted state, or not inserted yet. So we've got not inserted yet, then something can be inserted, or it takes up space. And then after that, it can be deleted. And actually, if items are deleted multiple times concurrently, then you can be like deleted five times. Um, it's important to track that for certain reasons. So I can apply all of my changes. So apply the, uh, let's see, apply the delete of um, the, the I, then apply the insert of the E, and then apply the insert of the Y. So it's three applications, uh, three applies. Then I'm going to retreat them. And when I do a retreat, well, the E and the Y go from the inserted state in the current state variable, changes to say they're not yet inserted. And the deleted I changes from being in the deleted state to being in the inserted state. This brings the document back to looking like what it looked like at that fork point, at least as far as the current state variable goes. So now we can apply all of your changes, which is what we wanted. So now you're doing a bunch of inserts and we've got these insert positions that you're giving me. So your events say I'm going to insert space SAM at positions two, three, four, five. Well, to look up and figure out where those inserted positions correspond to, we use the current state variable. So Item two is going to be after two items that are in the inserted state, uh, where the current state is inserted. And I find that location in the list, and then we do a regular CRDT insertion. And the CRDT insertion needs to kind of be blind and just ignore the existence of anything that's in the uh, not yet inserted state, because those are concurrent inserts. Um, but when I do the um, CRDT integrate function, which is what YGS calls it at least, then we might end up with two concurrent inserts that are inserted into the same, same location in the list, in the CRDT list. And for that, we just delegate to the regular CRDT rules. So this lets us just reverse the graph. We applied all of my changes. Then we retreated all of my changes. And that put the CRDT state back in a state where we could apply your changes. So then we apply all of your changes. Uh, and as we apply your changes, we can also transform them. So Remember, we're inserting things into a list. Well, we can look up what those positions are in the end state. So every time we insert something into the list, we look at where the position is, like how many items before that item are in have an end state of inserted. Because I've also got the text document, which I'm updating as I apply everything. And the end state describes the actual position in the text document that I'm keeping up to date. So uh, that was a really confusing way to say it. but. The effect of running this algorithm is that we end up doing operational transform as well. We're going to end up transforming all of your, the incoming changes, all the concurrent changes, by all of the other changes that we've already applied to get the resulting state. And we can do that in a n log n time, or log n time for operation, which is fabulous. So we apply all of my changes. We retreat all of them. We apply all of your changes. But then, let's say, after we've merged, one of us adds an exclamation mark to the end of the document. Maybe there's a bunch more changes underneath that. 
At this point in time, if we wanted to keep on updating the CRDT, what we could, what we would then need to do is uh, re-enable all of my changes. So we had retreat and then we have advance. So we just advance all of my changes again. And after we've done that, the CRDT state, uh, well, the end, sta end state and current state variables will match because the end position time and current position are the same, which is that merge point. Um, and after then we can just continue applying any other changes further down in the graph, which is what we want. Now, the reality is that there's a couple optimizations we can apply to this algorithm. The first one is that if there's a big long string of purely sequential changes, I mean, you must have noticed that in insert at position a thousand, we can do a bunch of CRDT nonsense, but the outcome is that we're going to insert at position a thousand if there's no concurrent changes. The CRDT structure only changes the position of things if there's concurrent edits. Um, and even then, most of the work that the CRDT does deals with concurrent inserts at exactly the same location in the list. So if there's no concurrent changes, we can actually just take the original edits and apply them directly. We can output them directly. When there are concurrent changes, it turns out that none of those... So remember that CRDT structure stores the origin left and origin right or the left parent and sequence number or whatever else. It turns out that all of those details only matter if there are concurrent changes. And all of the items that aren't concurrent with some insert or delete um, those fields don't actually affect where the item ends up. Uh, this is a very hand wavy to, way to say it, but the result of all of this is that we can just fill in, like, say, let's say we've got a whole sequence of sequential changes and then a fork point. We can create at that fork point a dummy CRDT object that just contains, like, a bunch of inserts with junk data um, corresponding to what the document looked like right before the fork. So we don't actually have to generate the CRDT all the way along. And that sounds like it might be a lot of work. We just create, we use internal run length encoding. So we just create one run of junk data um, or dummy data when a fork happens uh, to build the CRDT structure. This means that we actually only need to generate the CRDT structure when there's bubbles. The fact that we can do uh, purely sequential changes with no work whatsoever means that Eggwalker is way faster than CRDT-based systems when there's purely sequential changes. And the reality is that most changes are purely sequential. Most documents are only ever edited by one user, or if they're edited by multiple users, the users take turns. And I wish I had data on that. I've only heard that anecdotally um, about uh, Evernote, and I've seen it in practice um, at some companies I've worked at, but I've never recorded stats on it. So the other case is when I've already got a document at some point in time and I want to merge all of your changes in. Or likewise, you've got the document with all of your changes that say it says, hi, Sam, and you want to merge my changes in that change it to, hey, Sam. In this case, we need to generate the CRDT object um, to be able to merge all the changes if the changes are concurrent. And what we do is we first of all find the most recent common version. So the most recent point in time where, um, where both of our histories have in common. And if you've got a really long branch, maybe that'll be a long time in the past, but usually it's pretty recent. We can generate a dummy CRDT object, just like I described at that point in time. And then if I'm merging your changes in, I'll then apply all of my changes locally, but I won't emit any, anything because they've already been applied to my local string. Once I've applied all of the changes to bring my local CRDT object that I need up to the point in time at which my local document uh, resides, then I can do retreat and apply all of your changes. And as I do that, I'm going to transform all of your changes into the local version that I have. It's a very hand wavy way to describe it, but the result of all of that work is that I end up being able to merge all of your changes into my document or my document and my changes into your document without doing much work. Um, we need to do work proportional to the amount of time since the most recent uh, fork point. So uh, the most recent common fork point. And usually that's pretty recent. The only times that that's not recent uh, is with very long lived, like say Git branches. And so for that reason in our paper, we've, uh, we've looked at some Git branches and converted the Git, Git um, histories into Eggwalker editing traces with the whole graph and everything to, so that we could measure how long those traces take to run. And the reality is that they actually run pretty well. The worst case performance for Eggwalker is similar to that of a CRDT. We have a bit more bookkeeping to do to be able to uh, traverse up and down the graph and figure out um, when we should be retreating and advancing. But performance is really good. Uh, it's fast in basically every situation. So I'm very happy with that. So well done. You deserve a round of applause for making it this far through this video. This has been a lot of technical content and most of it 
if I'm honest, is just me talking straight to the camera. Um, it's probably be better with a bunch of diagrams and lots of great diagrams. Hopefully I can add some in post. But to summarize all of that, Eggwalker is a new algorithm. It's not OT and it's not CRDT, even though it kind of is an operational transform algorithm and it influenced that by using a CRDT internally. Um, it's an approach that combines, in my mind, I hope the best of both worlds of operational transform and CRDT based systems. We get the, um, we don't have any memory usage, like no me resident memory usage like we have with operational transform. If you want to have a super light client that doesn't actually store any of the historical edits. So you can load up a text document. If you wanted to build Google Docs on it, you could load up Google Docs, uh, load up a document and it'll load instantly. And then after the documents uh, in memory, only when mergers need to happen, do you need to actually load any of the historical changes to be able to do those mergers. On the other, which as I say, unlike CRDTs, we don't need to load this big CRDT object in memory into the web browser or wherever else we're using it. It also has the nice advantage of CRDT based systems. And the biggest advantage that CRDTs have is that they're fast. So we don't have the N squared uh, performance properties that some operational transform systems have. In our testing, Eggwalker performed uh, competitively with all of the other systems that we tested. There was a couple situations in which Eggwalker was outperformed by YGS um, because YGS is very well written and doesn't need to store or look at the graph at all. So when the graph was very complicated, Eggwalker was slightly outdone by uh, YGS. But um, Generally though, Eggwalker has n log n performance if you're processing n changes, which makes it very fast in the average expected cases. And yeah, and that's really cool. So I think that that makes Eggwalker a great algorithm for lots of applications. I hope that you use it. I hope someone uses it because I spent the last couple of years of my life working on this and I think it's fabulous. Um, I'd really love to see this implemented inside Google Docs and all the Google Wave type things of the future in wikis everywhere. I think it should work well in a centralized context because it's so fast. Um, it's as fast as OT, really, uh, faster in many cases. And I think it should also work great in a decentralized context. So if someone wanted to rebuild Git on top of it, I think that would be really cool. Um, yeah, so yeah, well done. Uh, I need to thank a bunch of people uh, because I didn't do this alone. I think about it as like all of this work that I did, but the reality is that I got so much help. Um, Mike Tumum funded off, out of his own pocket a whole lot of the research that he did for years, which was so generous of him. And we spent so many hours talking about this stuff late into the night. Um, Greg Little, the whole Braid community has supported me along the way. Um, and then Martin Kleppman, who's been amazing helping write the paper uh, and proving out that this algorithm is correct and helping in so many ways to be able to get this piece of research out there. And also my loving girlfriend for being wonderful. I, I love her lots, um, so thank you. Finally, if you'd like to know more, please look at the links on this page. Um, we have a pseudocode implementation. We have a TypeScript implementation of the algorithm in a few hundred lines of code. So if you want to read it, uh, all that code works. It's correct. It uh, generates identical results to our much more complicated implementation, which is in thousands of lines of Rust. Uh, the, our Rust code in the Diamond Types repository is highly optimized and very fast. And that's what we're actually benchmarking in the paper. Turns out there's a whole lot of optimizations that you can do to CRDTs and to Eggwalker-based systems. And applying all of those optimizations um, gives you several orders of magnitude of extra performance, which you absolutely want in practice. Uh, so have a look at all of that, have a read of the paper, and please let me know if you end up using it in some systems. I would love to see it in use. Uh, cool, thanks for watching. Bye.